Hey all. Hey, we've been talking about how the way we see God impacts our lives. Um, all of us have these tapes that play in our head, narratives, um, the way we see the world, the way we see ourselves, and the way we see God, um, how all those things fit together. And, and those things largely impact our relationship with God and our relationship with the world. Um, the Bible tells us that we um, are transformed by the renewing of our minds. See, what God wants is for us to come to understand and see things the way they really are, to see them according to the truth, so that we are then able to live our lives um, in the light of that truth. Um, one of the, the narratives that is really dominant in um, our culture, our society, our world, um, and even in Christianity, is this idea that God only loves us when we're good. You know, another way we might put that is that um, um, God's acceptance of us is, is based on our performance. When we do well, you know, God is pleased with us. When we don't do well, then God is angry with us. That's a, a very dominant narrative. Um, I think you'd agree. And it's, it's understandable, you know, why we think this way. Our, our world is based, by and large, on performance. Um, from the time we're little kids, we grow up with this idea that um, that we have to do well, and it's good to do well. So, so for instance, you know, when when you're taught as a little kid the difference between right and wrong, what often happens is your parents will discipline you when you do wrong, and they will praise you when you do right, and so it reinforces this idea that that love, you know, the the love that accepts us on the basis of our identity that that's conditional as well. When in reality, that what happens is that um, our, how would I put it? Our, our actions can be evaluated on the basis of performance, but, but us as people, um, we are loved unconditionally by God. Um, there's a story in the New Testament that illustrates this um, pretty well. And this is um, Jesus calling Matthew to be one of his disciples. You can pick it up with me in Matthew chapter 9, <clears throat> and, um, excuse me, yeah, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. <clears throat> it says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Then it happened as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, he went home to Matthew's house and was hanging out with Matthew, having a meal with Matthew, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So what's what's going on in this story? Uh, Matthew's a tax collector. You know, and I know that, you know, all of us kind of have this thing with IRS agents, right? You know, if they came knocking on our door wanting to do an audit, um, we would be concerned about that. But But that's really not what was happening in the first century. A tax collector worked for the Roman government. And as a Jew... Matthew was seen, rightly seen, as a collaborator with the Roman government. He sat at a tax booth, and um, as Jews came by, you know, he basically enforced the law, took their money, skimmed some off the top for himself. So it's interesting, isn't it, that that when the um, when the Bible refers to sinners and tax collectors, it's always tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors are a whole category of sinner all by themselves. And so the, the Pharisees see Jesus, you know, first of all, interacting with Matthew, then going to Matthew's house, then um, all of Matthew's friends, his fellow tax collectors and sinners come to, um, to dine with them. And the Pharisees response to that is, doesn't Jesus know who he's eating with? Doesn't he understand how evil these people are? What is he doing hanging out with these evil folks? And Jesus' response is an awesome one. You know, he says, he first of all, he didn't come 
um, a physician needs to go to to the sick, not to the healthy, and that he didn't come to call righteous people, but he came to call sinners. And he puts that line in the middle. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. What Jesus is saying is that people need the love of God, that, that God comes after us. He seeks us. Remember, Jesus says that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He says that, that his mission was to come and to give his life as a ransom for many. Romans 5.8 tells us that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The entire world, the Jewish population included, <laughs> were, were separated from God. We're his enemies. We're on the wrong side. And God wanted to bring us back into his family. We were separated from the time of creation, from the sin of Adam. You know, our, um, the first man who was ever created, um, the forefather of us all, he sinned and plunged us all into this position where we are, are separated from God for eternity unless God acts and does something to change that. And that's exactly what he did. Think about John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. See, God had a plan, and that plan was, was instituted, formulated, put into action because of his love. The compassion that God felt for you and me is what drove him to send his Son into the world to save us. God didn't love us based on our performance. He loved us in spite of our performance. God reaches for us. He seeks to save us. If you've been touched by that love, you know, if God has, has stepped in and touched your heart, reached you, you know what I'm talking about. You come to that place in your life where you recognize, um, I'm a sinner. There's... There's nothing I can do to help myself. And you reach out to God. And as you reach out to God, you find that he's there already reaching out to you. Uh, it's, it's actually hard to describe to folks who don't really understand it or have never experienced it. That moment when you acknowledge your guilt, your brokenness, your complete and utter inability to do what's right all the time. And you realize that that separation exists between you and God. Um, what happens is in that moment, you can come to him and he's already there waiting to receive you. And he's there waiting to receive you because he sent his son into the world. Because Jesus came into the world, um, lived that perfect life in our place, and then died a perfect death in our place took the penalty for our sin, absorbed the wrath of God on our behalf. That's an act of love. The Bible says that um, no greater love has any man than this, than that he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for his enemies. Romans 5.8, as I had read to you earlier, says that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 5.9 goes on like this. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, now that we've been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God is love. God is willing to sacrifice himself for you and me. He wants us to be able to be with him, not to be separated from him forever, not, not to you know experience punishment for all the bad things we've done. He took the punishment in our place. That's love. He did that so that we could be set free from that punishment, so that we don't have to experience hell. But instead, we can be invited into his family, adopted in as children, 
made heirs for the future of everything that he has. And then filled with his spirit so that we can in turn love others. First John chapter 4 says that we love because he first loved us. You see, God showed us what love is, and then he filled us with that love, and he enables us then to turn around and to love others. Jesus was called the friend of sinners. Are you a friend of sinners? Has that love transformed you to the place where you can accept people in spite of their actions? Not that their actions can't be evaluated and people can't be helped to do better. It's not my point. My point is that people need love. And of all people, we as Christians who have received the love of God need to be willing to step up and to love others. Look at the transformation that took place in Matthew's life. From tax collector, evil man, taking advantage of, um, of the Jewish people, to the man who wrote the gospel, the good news about Jesus for the Jewish people. That's an amazing thing. That's what God does with folks. He loves them. And he wants to love them through us. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for the love that you have given us. Lord, we have no chance in this world without you. But now that we have been reconciled, now that we have come near to you because you came near to us, um, Lord, you've given us this job to be ambassadors for you, to plead for others that they too be reconciled to Christ. You've already reconciled yourself to the world, Lord. I pray that you use us, each and every one of us, to love others to the place where they see your love for what it is and they desire to be reconciled to you once for all and forever. Lord, thank you for this. Empower us, use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Have a great week.